Hello, UK Crime Book Club. We are now live. I'm just checking. I've actually sent it to the right place while we've been chatting on a half, which is always a good sign. Congratulations on publication day, gorgeous Kate Bendela. Thank you. Hello, UK Crime Book Club, and hello, Sam. I've not put the books up behind me. The one job I gave myself to do. Right, show oh. me books. So, right. so that's flashing yeah. yeah, the right way around on my screen. Yeah, so that's yeah. flesh and blood. Am I doing that so? That's and then my... they've recently right. been rebranded. I'm going to have to get up now. It's a good job I've not just got my pajama bottoms on, isn't it? <laughs> Done that before now. <laughs> so my first book was The Real CSI, a forensic handbook for crime writer. I'll knock everything over, but I've got that and as well. The first in the Socko Meyer Barton series is definitely dead. And the second is Shattered Bones. It's really and I don't do know this. which one yeah. traumatised me more. And then, yep, today <laughs> it is the birth of flesh and blood. Oh, not very good with this camera thing. Am I? It's it back to front. Try you have to I do know, the whole, like, we'll do this and then this. Yeah, yeah, well, we see. I'll, by the end of the hour, I will have sussed it. Yeah, and then you forget for next time, because I, I do Absolutely. it every time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I am very excited. It is the last in the Socko Maya Barton trilogy. So for anybody who's not read it, where have you been? I've got I a know. mortgage to pay. How how dare you? <laughs> um, <laughs> my protagonist is a senior crime officer, Maya Barton, and the trilogy follows her as she grows and develops in her role, as well as the general backstory over the last three, over the three books as well, is her turbulent relationship with a estranged father Marcus Naylor who is in prison and yeah and that comes to a climax on the end of book three but it's hard to like say it's hard to talk about it without revealing too much can't talk about a thing I don't know why I've bothered inviting you <laughs> no, yeah. anyway can't thanks everyone bye <laughs> I said I literally and I'm not I know I can't even say what I said to you before we came no, online no I know nothing mm. Not a thing, we'll just have to sit here and answer yeah, questions. Yeah, I know. No, you're, you're, you're mad at me for the <laughs> turn of events that happen mm -hmm. here. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zip it up, throw away the key. Absolutely. Um, how we're going to start with what, I re what I'm really wanting to know. You, um, you've talked a lot about the struggles with COVID and things. Yes. You've mentioned it in the book. Mm -hmm. Hi, Laura. Laura Hi, Hamilton's Laura. already joined us. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I know it was a struggle um, just writing the third one because there was a long period where you couldn't write. You know, yeah. you weren't, you've not been very well. I'm mm -hmm. very, very thankful to know that you are much better now. Thank you. Um, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really nice to see you. It's really nice to have you back. Yeah. It, and I do, um, go on. I, I was going to say, I, I do very much feel like I'm back. I mean, I know because you and I, obviously, for anyone that doesn't know, Sam and I, we were just saying it's quite ironic, really. We're going to see each other at Harrogate <laughs> next weekend, which is a bit embarrassing because we only actually live up the road from each other and we don't get together enough. And I think yeah. the last time you and I got together, um, that's when I was really still sort of in the grips of long COVID. And you write, I couldn't write um, physically. Mm. It was too much. I was drained. The fatigue yeah. of the chronic pain was horrendous. And... The brain fog, obviously, as well, massive thing. How can you write when nothing, everything's just stuck? Yeah. Um, and as well for me, the third book's very, very personal. This is the only one out of the series that I've not had anybody read an early draft of. Mm. I pretty much wrote it, and then when it was gone, when I submitted it to the publishers, then it went out. And the reason it was because it is a very personal book. Because yeah. um, we'll maybe talk about it a bit, get in a bit more detail, but. Maya goes through a process called the MDR to help with a, a post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. which is something I've personally dealt with. So because it was an emotional book to write, because it was something that was uh, sort of triggered me a little bit writing. Yeah. Having long COVID, not being on top form didn't help. But I'm pleased to say now I have recovered. I'm so very grateful for the support of a good friend of mine called Faye. Um, she's a nutritionist. Um, she's on Facebook as Lift Nutrition. And she's absolutely amazing. She helps people. Uh, she's also sort of specialising in um, stomach conditions and people with perimenopause and stuff like that. The difference wow. you can make to yourself with food and the correct nutrition yeah. and maybe any relevant supplements has been amazing. Um, and I have, I'm also really pleased to say that a few months, well, a few weeks ago now, months ago, um, I started running again because I used to run many, many years ago. And set, the yeah, I did the Couch to 5K, the NHS podcast, <coughs> which was absolutely brilliant. Never thought I did it. Week two, I thought I was going to mm. die. 
mean, you know, I'm a drama queen, but yeah, I was literally flogging myself down the loop. Like I'm going to die. People <laughs> phoned me an ambulance and was drawing chalk lines around myself. Um, but yeah, um, I've even went out this morning. Obviously, we went out for a boozy publication day lunch and I just nipped mm. out for a quick two and a half mile run first. So yeah, I'm now going to pick my miles up and looking to do a 10K if I can. That's the next plan. But I'm so grateful that I've got my health back. Um, I feel like I'm back out on the circuit as well because obviously this book's fin finally finished and is out yeah. there. Um, we did Bradford Literature Festival a few weeks ago. We did Crown well, Central well, 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 Library. And she said it was brilliant. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was a fantastic event. Mm -hmm. It was really, really good fun. Um, obviously, we're going to Harrogate next weekend. So I finally feel at last after what's been quite a horrendous hi hiatus and been through a bit, bit of a shitty dark time, really. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I do feel like I'm back and now planning, plodding on with a standalone as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean you're not going to write another trilogy? <laughs> Well, did I not tell you once, if I ever tell you I'm going to write another series, I want you to shoot me in the head. <laughs> you might not have said shoot you in the head. Yeah, That's the sense of it, yeah. Um, <coughs> as I do say that, but then Graham Bartlett and I were chatting in yes. um, in Bradford and he, did, he said to me, oh, what would you do if people said they want more Maya? And I was like, oh, I don't know. So never say never. I don't know if I'd do another series. <laughs> Like I say, just talking about the running, I never thought I'd run again and I'm doing over a 5K. So never say never. We'll see. But for now, it's all about the standalone. So, yeah. <laughs> Who is your lead in your standalone? Can I ask that? Yeah, I was wondering whether you're planning on using any more Sokko characters. There is going to be a Sokko character in it and a detective as well who plays quite a prominent part in it and has quite a... I can't give too much away. Has quite a strong influence <laughs> on our Sokko not, character. Not talk about your books, is it? Kate? Not, is it? It's not. <laughs> but what I'm excited about, you know, I like to have a protagonist who's a little bit different. So in the standalone, my protagonist is actually the murder victim. Oh, yeah, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So basically, she um she comes into consciousness to realize first of all she's dead, which it's like not the great start to the week, is it really? Oh, no, it's not the and then week, what what could be worse than that? She realizes she's been murdered. So yeah, we do hear from the the protagonist has a certain level of sentient. She's sentient, so she's in limbo until she figures out who's killed her. So yeah, it's you can quite all, a, hear all of the authors. <laughs> One of these, like scribbling down ideas, just spin offs from what you've just said. It's it's scary, it's daunting because it's something brand new. And I can only equate it to the thought of starting a brand new job because obviously you've applied for the job, so you know what you're going to be doing, yeah. but you don't know the lay of the land, you don't know who your colleagues are, you don't know how it's going to pan out, you don't know if people are going to put your lunch in the bin and staple your cardigan to the desk while you're trying to work, you know, all that sort of stuff. It, Where it's, on it's earth you worked? No, do you know what? I, no, I remember <laughs> that was actually a real-life scenario. Somebody, I remember watching, I think it was a documentary on Channel 4 once about some guy who was horrendously bullied, and I just remember them saying it was they were trying to staple his cardigan to the desk and he threw his lunch in the bin. Well, oh, and he, can... they all went to the pub on lunchtime and he bought all his colleagues a full round of drinks and then when he went back to the table with all the drinks, everybody had gone, oh man, that's like really, oh, I know. Isn't it weird what sticks in your head? That yeah. must have been like 20 odd years ago when I watched that and it's just it is, well. to mind. <laughs> See that's I don't know why I'm laughing. It's well, sort of funny. No, no, it's all, it does beg the question, <laughs> would you just sit all afternoon and just drink it all and just not bother going back? God, yeah. Yeah, what do you get a phone call? Right. I'm glad we've raised <laughs> this because let's just, uh, can I spill to our audience? Yeah. So I'm not one to brag. It is publication day. My beautiful husband has bought me a couple <coughs> of my way, which you're sharing. So here's me sipping on my champagne. What are you Chip. drinking, Sam? Lager in a mug. <laughs> Lager in a mug. <laughs> One of tell me you're from friends. Salford without telling know, me you're from right? Salford. Well, no, there is, I mean, people know this. You probably know this. The reason I started drinking an out of a mug if I was going to drink anything was because um, when I worked at school. There Did was you drink lager a... in a mug when you worked at school? No. <laughs> Please don't say Did that. You... And I'll <laughs> cut that bit out and use it. No, there was, um, I went out for a family tea, me, Dave, kids. And somebody took a photo of us sat the table, me with a glass of rose. I very well behaved, family tea, you know, couldn't even yeah. get my picture in my face in it. I had my back to everyone in the pub for this reason. Um, 
so then I got paranoid that some of the, one of the kids was going to find the videos and see me with a glass of something. And then people started sending me mugs. This one's my favourite. <laughs> it's fantastic, um, that. I do it like is that. Really good. Although the voices aren't real, they've got some pretty good ideas. I, I talked to myself in my head a lot. There's lots of people, yeah, lots of people trying to get out and they all mm. talk over each other. I can't understand them, so I've written nothing. Um, that's my excuse and I'm sticking mm. to it. But um, yeah, so that's why it's still in the mug because people sent me lovely mugs. So now I use that's them. That's a brilliant story. <laughs> <laughs> Not that good. I did um, change my profile picture for a while to me of one with sunglasses on with a, a woolly <laughs> winter hat and like hiding behind something. Kind of a, yeah, in joke. I don't work there anymore. I could put it in a glass, but I don't want to. I like No, my you do you. You do you, love. No one's judging. There. I've already missed my mouth about four times today. So. <laughs> what a waste. <laughs> I know. That's the one thing I never spill. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, Laura said hi. I've heard lots about Kate's books. I maybe read one of the guilty ones. Uh, I maybe read one of the guilty ones that I haven't read yet. Need to check the TBR first. Laura, I've been mm -hmm. recommending these books for a couple of years now. So. Come on, Laura. Yes, come on. Pull your socks up. Back of the class. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody has said, sorry to hear you weren't well. I'm glad you are now, but I can't oh, see, thank you. I can't see the, who it is. I sorry, can just see sir. Facebook user. Yeah. And Kaz has said hello. Hi, How Kaz. was it being the host at Lit Fest, Kate? So you did some oh, hosts. I did. Well, I did. Uh, that's a really good question. It was terrifying because um, trying to compile the questions for my <laughs> panel members, which were Graham Bartlett, which is obviously not a problem because obviously for those of us who know we, Graham and I You've know each other go back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The two of you have yeah. come on. Came so on together. Um, Graham wasn't a problem. Um, Professor Angela Gallup, um, she was so I'd never met her I'd read her books because mm -hmm. the lit fest had sent them what an amazing lady then we realized actually we had co uh, ex-colleagues of mine at, mm -hmm. she knew so because we went out for dinner after the event and it was lovely to chat to her and get to know her a bit better and Carla Valentine um who I think I've, I've mentioned her books quite a lot one of mm -hmm. them is the first one is past mortems which is brilliant and it's about her life when she was a working as a um, mortuary technician mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Carla had to cancel on the last minute. So the Lit Fest said, so basically everything I'd planned had then gone because I'd tried it's to... Really, yeah, one person it, not it's being able not to, easy, it? is it? It's hard. <laughs> so, um, they, you mean we make it look so easy? Oh, I know. I will. You do. You, are, you really, really do. So, um, yeah, it was really good fun. Um, they asked me if rather than taking the lead of host as well, I would also talk about my own experience is so... Um, it was a nice opportunity to chat about my experiences mm. as a, a my job as a crime scene investigator, which, as you know, I love and I can talk yeah. about that and writing all day long. So it was good. It went really well. But I, I can't lie. It was probably out of all the events I've done. It was the most daunting because hosting and trying to plan these questions and then you're thinking, have I got enough questions to fill the hour? And it you, you don't well, you, you you don't need me to tell you, do you, Sam? It's, it's difficult. It's it's a lot. But it's it went easier. really, really good. Yeah, I can imagine so. It's whereas being asked the questions, easy, but trying oh, to plan no. them and being asked questions, no. Yeah, no, no. So... I'll say on this side. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask you how your writing's going, but you're not gonna answer me then, are you, about that? Or... Um no. No, okay. Just tell no. me to shut up. You usually do. No, we'll we'll discuss I that. In, we'll discuss that in Harrogate sure. in more detail. No, never once. <laughs> um, Kaz has said, first. "Tell us about the book covers." Oh, so, so are all yeah. three having new covers? Yeah, all three have been rebranded, and this unfortunately, I haven't got the other covers. I was just saying to my husband today, we need to. I need to order the other two books. Oh, so I've got those covers. They have been rebranded. So obviously those two, the early two were, uh, uh, there we go. They're the two that I was going to put on display, but yeah. you've got different covers. So, so they I do, they've been rebranded. I like these covers. And now I'm good really to tell I've not got a third. Well, though, so. I do. Well, I love the, the cover of uh, Flesh and Blood. Um, hmm. There was a problem because when they sent me Flesh and Blood through the publishers, they said, we're also going to rebrand the other two books to go with it. So um, that was fine. And then they said to me, oh, they'll be on Amazon next week. And I thought they would have sent me the first two covers as well to check. 
and they are they are brilliant i like them now but unfortunately the first one they showed me um definitely dead they rebranded that and at the top right hand corner there was a picture of a, a middle-aged white woman walking carrying a florence nightingale style lamp and it was like you've whitewashed my book because obviously my protagonist might uh, yeah. is a late mixed race late 20s female so I was horrified. So anyway, they obviously have since pulled it and changed it with a cover, a, a picture of a, a soccer on there working. But it just goes to show you just, I don't know how it works, who got the brief that, to do this cover. I mean, I do like the covers. I think the new the new style, I like them. I have very... found the image, but it's... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. There. Yeah. So I'll try and find another one where I'm... Um, where oh, you can actually computer see the covers whiz. better. Thank you. But are you happy with the covers now? Yeah, I love them. Yeah, I think they're really good. They do look like I say, I'm going to have to get the other two just so I've got matching set. Yeah. You have two, darling. <laughs> and I will as well. I will buy them for my shelf. Um, I'll have another look for the covers soon. Unless anybody yeah. can find them, can you please tell, tell Sam. I'm just reading writing. that. Tell no, Sam no, no, about no. writing. <laughs> you weren't going to let me get away with that. But no, so <laughs> no, Donna. Thank you. I had to go and look, look see if I could see who it was now. So the plan is, what we're going to do is we're going to get you to take your laptop to Harrogate and you say you get there Friday afternoon. If we get there about the same time, we're basically just going to lock you in a room all weekend and not let you out until you've come out with the first draft. How does that sound? The funny thing is, I've got a husband and four kids. I'm never sat still for very long. <laughs> and you want to lock me in a room and you think I'm going to do anything but that. <laughs> Not going to work. Fair enough. Okay, I was going to offer to push beer and snacks through the door as well to keep you fueled and uh, and going. Mm, no, I'd still just get comfy. I know. Well, yeah, this you is would, the problem. Yeah, but, yeah, this is yeah. the problem. It's when you. That's the thing when you've got kids, especially in the house, and then you've had that adult time to yourself, and you feel like you've suddenly gone deaf. <laughs> you go, mom, mom, mom. Yeah. Somebody, <coughs> excuse me. Um, somebody has said, well, somebody's asked what's next for Maya, but you're not, this is, this is the trilogy. This is the trilogy, moment. yeah. So, oh, I can't you believe You touched that. on it before, but I am going to make you answer this. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> just the fact that you touched on the fact that never say never, but. I know, I was just going to say what's next for Maya. I know I've just said it is a trilogy and it was always intended to be a trilogy. Yeah. Purely because of the backstory. And then that it was going to end there. Can we just can we just remove Donna from yeah. the group? Like, yeah, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's there is no immediate plans for another Maya book. However, we'll see what the little characters in my head say. Yeah. Because sometimes the characters get very loud, as we know, and you can't ignore them. So we'll see. If she starts waking me up at four o'clock in the morning with write me, write me, write me, then there'll probably be another book. But we'll see. At the moment, there are no plans to. Is that a diplomatic answer? That's the diplomatic <laughs> <Yeah>. answer. <laughs> Donna wants to electrocute me, but only because she loves me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> she, <laughs> right, tell us what you've been doing to Gary while we're on um, oh, things that people need so, to people. As you know, um, I was Crime Central, Gary found fame um, because Amanda Lees, one of the authors and um, people in the audience, won a copy of the book. And it was Christy Newport who threw me under the bus and mentioned that of course, in Christy the copy, did. of course, Christy did. In the copy, oh God, I'm really no good at this, Sam. Really not. Right, how's, still, how's that's that? fine. right okay. Uh, so in the copy, the real CSI. Don't talk to me about the hand. Don't mention the hand. It really winds me up. So on page 22, how it came about, the publisher said to me, is there any way you could get, including the photographs of the book, a picture of a dead body? No, because no. not only is that morally wrong and would lose me my job, just no. Yeah. So what do you do when you've not got a real dead life body? You get rid of your kids to the grandparents for the for, for the day and get your husband to wrap himself and scones himself in wheelie bin carrier bags and lie on the lawn. And I heard to the neighbours as Gary's lying there <laughs> looking dead. And but he, At first, his hand wasn't revealed. And then it sort of just looked like a load of rubbish on the lawn, which was annoying me. So we ripped a bit of the bin bag for him to shove his hand out. But I just don't think his hand looks dead. It doesn't. It's too... What it's is too, too alive looking? <laughs> it is. Maybe you should have put a bit of makeup on it to make it paler or something, or even some blood. If blood, that's what's missing. Catch up. Yeah, he needs blood on his hand. 
right so anyway so this story came out <laughs> crime <laughs> central and the fame has now gone to gary's head because amanda okay. lee's asked him to autograph the page in her book so now he is known as the man in the bag or also by the end of that night after we'd gone to the pub or poor gary which i think emanated from christy and amy newport so yeah there we go so now the fame's gone to his head. So Gary's coming with me to Harrogate, but you'll probably see him swanning around in his bin bag so he can <laughs> identify to his followers who he is. <laughs> oh, so, um, yeah. Apparently, you, um, Guy Hale told me that you had a safe word. And <laughs> we did. We did have the safe word at Crime Central, which was dogging. <laughs> Why did I not check what the safe word was for us? <laughs> That was because Wasn't it was there a tame word first, a quite a tame word. Um probably. <laughs> there was, and I can't remember. I can't even remember who suggested doggy now. But is that seems quite natural to me because one of the poems I wrote, which is on YouTube, is called Doggy. <coughs> if <anyone> knows, <coughs> I'll go on YouTube and look up the look Can up the poems. Don't um don't put the don't play it in front of sensitive adults or children because it's a bit sweary and rude. Because it's mean, a poem about either. dogging, so it would be. <laughs> and not dog walking for the more naive amongst us, of which you you and I are not one. <laughs> well, well, you might you might be, yeah. sorry. You are you are, yeah. I am the most vanilla <laughs> sheltered person you'll ever meet, Mrs. Bendler. Wait till um, Harrogate. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who said this, Donna said, I always think it's um, harder to be the spouse or family of a crime writer. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. My I'm, kids always say, say we have so. the wildest conversations around the dinner table. And yeah. then it's kind of like, well, we'll be talking about something and we'll all kind of look at each other. And then they'll be like, nah, not even top 10. <laughs> Whatever we're talking about. Yeah. I, I don't even know where to begin with that. Um, Laura's suggesting she'll be kind and suggest a GoFundMe for a writer's retreat if we all chip to the quid. <laughs> yeah. There's like seven of us. Where are you sending me for fish and chips? No, that won't even get seven quid now. <laughs> uh, no. Right. Um, the bit of this book I feel like I can talk yes. about. County Lines. Ah, can yeah. you explain okay. County yeah. Lines? Because I wrote down the page number that you kind of bring up County Lines, page 11 and 12, for anyone who wants to have a look. Yeah. Um, you know, while you're reading through. <laughs> I'm not being locked in your spare, spare room, Donna. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> crying out loud. You started. I know. Started Sorry. On now. <laughs> Cheers, Kate. <laughs> um. And it, it's just a little description of county lines um, for people. Yeah. Who, because obviously we've both done a lot of safeguarding training mm -hmm. over the years and we get to hear different things. And obviously you're going to have completely different stories filtered through than I've got, you know, yeah. from working in a primary school, it's mm -hmm. going to be a different audience, isn't it? You know, yeah. the staff, the colleagues there are going to yeah. need different things to look out for. Mm. So I think it's always really helpful when somebody elaborates on county lines in the book. Yeah, so basically, it can be quite confusing. It can be. Um, so basically, county lines is when basically what happens is kids, teenagers are courted by criminals. Um, it could be quite sinister that courting can involve recruiting them so that they get them into debt, they get them hooked on drugs, and then they owe them debts for the drugs. Um, they can be CSE, which is child sexual exploitation as well, of boys and girls. Um, where those children are, are sort of courted, they're, they're bribed with perfume, jewellery, all sorts, and then the next thing they're in love with a person and then they're doing anything for them which can involve, yeah. again, dealing drugs or sleeping with other people, um, prostitution to make money for that person. Um, usually they'll be recruited by somebody who is outside. The reason it's called county lines is it might be that that criminal recruits somebody, say, so they might recruit somebody from Manchester, but they live in Liverpool. And I think the idea is to sort of evade uh, the, the sort of the criminal network and the yeah. police know who they're, who, who is active on their area, if you like. Um, although other police forces do talk to each other, it can blur the lines a little bit. But yeah, it's it's, it's a huge thing, county lines. Um, and there's a big, there's a lot of, if it's something you are worried about, if you know teenagers or one thing we say is, first of all, is look out, how have they changed? Have they suddenly become um, sort of 
is the personality changed? Are they more aggressive? Are they more subtly overconfident? Are they coming home with with gifts like trainers, phones, jewelry, perfume? Have they become more secretive about the friends? They become more secretive about where they're going. Are they coming home smelling maybe of cigarettes or cannabis? Um, just really, just let, pay close attention to that change in um, personality, and you know, it, it's it is unfortunately. We, we can talk about it and to us it wouldn't shock us because we know it goes on because of our, our, our sort of lines of work, like you said earlier. Um, it's quite shocking if you do know it goes on and how quickly kids can get embroiled in it yeah. um, and how once they're then in that criminal network, it practically seems almost impossible for them to come out, especially if they're being bribed because they owe money, um, they're hooked on drugs. Um, again, they've got they've got videos of themselves of, of them or photographs of them being involved in sexual activities and they're being threatened if you don't carry on doing this for me I'll send it to your school to your mom yeah. to your grandma it's it's horrible it's utterly horrendous it's just blackmailing yeah. kids and it, it is the lowest of the low really um it's something I wanted to write about because it's not some it's something that is so prevalent now as a crime type and it doesn't all it doesn't get recognized enough and I think it's mm. something if you're aware of it maybe like say if you have teenagers in your life you can maybe look out for those signs and it can make such yeah. a big difference um one of the other things as well that's uh, put in the book in a similar nature is cuckooing cuckooing is when a a person a, a more vulnerable member of society whether they're elderly they might have um sort of certain special needs um mm. they have a house or an assisted living accommodation something like that they're befriended by um one of these gangs who are usually drug runners and then basically the home, home is took over while they um are producing drugs and selling drugs from the flat in the house again yeah. Certainly for me, I've known over the last five years, the increase in those sort of jobs coming up at work, we've seen them time and time again. And again, it's awful. You've seen vulnerable people yeah. being exploited. exploited. Again, um, it can be people maybe, again, more vulnerable members of the public if they're alcoholics, if they've got health issues or vulnerabilities because of their age, their disability, anything like that. The home is just taken over. And again, mm. once these people are in their lives, it's bloody hard to get rid of them. But where do you go? You've nobody to turn to. If you've no friends and family, yeah. um, you can't necessarily go to the police because the chances are they'll, uh, they're too scared or they might have something over on you. You know what I mean? Uh, the fact that they'll say, oh, when we first started coming around, they brought kids to do drugs in the flat and we'll tell the police you were giving kids drugs. And Again, mm. it's that blackmail and that sort yeah. of that fear thing for them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it does go on a lot. And, again, it might... It, it, so the last few cases I've dealt with, it's actually we've actually been tipped off by neighbours. It's neighbours recognising that people, although they've never maybe dealt with that person who's been cuckooed. Oh, yeah. Um, I lost you then. Am, am I back all right? You are yeah. Back. Um, although they may not necessarily have inter sort of interacted with that neighbour before, they suddenly realise that the people coming something. and going from the flat, something's just yeah. not right. And what I would say to people is just always trust your instincts on that sort of thing. Yeah. One of the things that you touch on that um, I thought was brilliant in the book is how um, people actually respond to teenagers. They forget that they are, you know, they might be all full of bravado mm -hmm. and, you know, bit, get a bit aggressive and getting a bit kind of cocky. But mm -hmm. actually, they are children. They are children. And it's something yeah. that really bugs me that people kind of judge teenagers. There was um, a leaflet years ago that um, the council handed out and there was all different community things on it. And one of them okay. was um, labelled antisocial behaviour. And it was two teenagers sat on a bench, two other teenagers stood next to the bench and they're on a park. That that was the antisocial behaviour. Yeah. God forbid. God forbid. Yeah. Teenagers use parks. Yeah, I know. But Just it's yeah. not like that, you know, they weren't they were literally four kids. They're not doing on anything, of course they are. And and that's for and me. Forget uh, that it comes from the adults as well. It doesn't come from the absolutely, teenagers. Absolutely. They do get a bad press. And yeah. you know, it, it it's terrifying because and that's one of the things I wanted to sort of show like the beginning of the book when one of the one of the first characters is is one of the early characters is stabbed is it shows Maya going to the hospital to record his injuries and he's on the children's ward because yeah. he is a child. 
Is and they might be on the curtains or teddy bears. Yeah, bear teddy bears on the cur- curtains. Yes, yeah, something like that. So just to show, they're on a children's ward because they are children. But like yeah. you say, they do get a, bad, a lot of bad press. And what the other thing is as well, this obviously there's a lot of knife crime in the book, and that's something that I wanted to show as well because mm. unfortunately that's that's the reality these days. So to, to give you an example how how much has changed, I recently did my first day professional course at work, and um, I would say. 60 odd 70 percent of that was about basically helping people who've been stabbed dealing with knife wound right. injuries and the reason was because like the the lady said who was running the course when do when do stabbings happen when do knife attacks happen is it just weekend is it just sort of 12 o'clock on a saturday evening no it's not it's eight o'clock wednesday morning it's prevalent it's all the time and a lot of it as well as again because these kids now have got this culture of fear mm unfortunately they are just carrying knives with a view that it will protect me and it's like no you no, that's the problem no, and it, yeah, be used on yeah. yeah so yeah it's it's just a sad state of affairs and I wanted to write something that did reflect I did worry at one point I thought when it had gone over to my editor and I did I was a little bit worried I thought it was going to say mm. to me oh there's too much knife crime in this book it's not realistic and I was like I can tell it's you if you want really realistic. Do you know honestly yeah. I mean I, for those who don't know obviously I'm still working as a crime scene investigator and what I'll say is in, in my area we have so many incidents of stabbings that don't even make the local rag they don't even make the local news because and it, it's it's scary you would not know it is it is an epidemic it really is it's horrible mm. and yeah it's scary having teenagers but I'm with you as well like you say a lot of the teenagers are genuinely genuinely good decent kids and yeah maybe we just need to cut them a bit of slack and you know they're not all a lot of them can be much victims of crime you just cut them some yeah. slack and just and I, I understand as well that if they're going around in groups it can look quite intimidating but it my can, god yeah i'm like five foot as you know i was gonna make <laughs> yeah. a joke before about um i'd have come doing couch to 5k with you but you'd be off the other end <laughs> of the park you'd be just doing laps around me but um throwing things at you saying right yeah. right right <laughs> while i'm running, while I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no um i've completely lost yeah no we were sorry that's my bad <laughs> yeah we were saying um, about how gangs are used can look quite intimidating yeah it can, well, it can my look God, quite with the threat of reality that there could be so these people out there wanting to genuinely engage them in county lines and mm. the risk of stabbing wouldn't you bloody walk around in a group if you were them yeah i would i don't know how i don't know how you leave the house <laughs> reluctantly <laughs> sulkily in my snoopy pajamas no i'm not gonna put my uniform on today let me get to work like this i don't want to adults um that i was just looking at a question that i'd written that i realized once i'd finished the book that i can't ask because oh, it gives okay. something away so right. i'll look at my next one um best bit of your job as a soccer and or as an author is the short version of the question i've written oh best bit about my job as a soccer undoubtedly without a shadow of a doubt is twofold it's helping people um even if you've got something like we, we say basic because vol- a burglary is classed as volume crime which means that yeah. it's something that is prevalent and it happens a lot if you've ever been burgled, you know that it is nothing minor about being burgled. It's bloody horrendous. It feels yeah, it's awkward. Awful. It's massively invasive and it takes forever to get over that feeling it of somebody being to in us your house. When I was a child, when I was a teenager, no, not even a teenager, I don't think. And I can still remember it vividly. Yeah. You know it's, what my memory's like. My memory's shocking, but the, yeah. that, it's not gone. Because it's a violation of your safe space. Yeah. That's why it's, it's awful. Yeah. And go into a burglary and be able to help someone and reassure them, offer them crime prevention advice. And when you first sort of arrive there, when they sort of the attitude that I've lived here for however many years and the house is going on the market today and it's like, no, no, you need to understand this is nothing personal towards you. It's a lottery and this is what you can do to prevent it happening again. And this is what we're going to do to sort of make it, even if you don't get any forensic evidence from that scene, a lot of the job is just that, my job is just that reassurance and trying to help people. Yeah. And also that feeling when you get, you do recover forensic evidence and it results in somebody getting identified and, and arrested. And then hopefully a decent sentence, which nearly not, <laughs> never happens, but we try. That feeling is brilliant. Yeah. It really, really is. I remember years ago working on, um, we'd had a murder. This It was quite a, a vulnerable um, member of society had been murdered by somebody and, 
it been weeks and weeks and we had still had no inquiries. We had it was back in the day before CCTV was everywhere and mobile phones were everywhere. See, I'm showing my age now. I'm showing my 21 so years of my and career. <laughs> so um and I remember we it, we did think it was gonna be one of those jobs that you we never gonna know who did it. <laughs> and then we got a tip off or something came to light that we were suddenly looking at one of the neighbours. And by now it'd been several weeks after the murder and we got enough to go warrant to go and pick this lad up and arrest him. And he went, right, first thing you need to do is just go through his house, just see, is there any traces of blood in that house? And I remember scouring the scene and thinking there's nothing obvious and then finding the tiniest little speck under the banister rail because it was one of those houses when you walk in, the right. stairs straight to the top of the flat and then his part of the building was at the top. And the, the relief when that job, that something like that, when the blood comes back and you know it's your victims and then you know you've got enough evidence to... Yeah nail somebody that there's no better feeling than that it's absolutely fantastic because then you've got closure for that victim and the family and justice at the end of the day nobody wants to think there's been a vicious murder and somebody's still walking around so yeah that's that's yeah. the best part of the job definitely that feeling and i also rem remember on that job recovering the stair carpet which was no mean feat on my own pulling up the stair carpet and rolling it round and then trying to package it yeah i don't think i could do that now like again showing my <laughs> age again i could do that uh, so the best, <coughs> the best bits about being an author. Andy um, Barrett's just agreed with you and said brilliant thing. Has it? Yeah, no, yeah. I know. Andy would know. Yeah, it is. It's the best. And, you know, this, Andy would also attest to the fact that we're not, it's not the best paid job in the world. But it, that feeling when you get a result like that yeah. makes it so, so worthwhile. It's honestly, it's fantastic. And when I look back over my careers, I'm sure somebody like Andy was as well. Um, I'm not one to sort of like, blow my own trumpet at all but when I look back and think some of the jobs me and my colleagues have worked on when we've got real results like that yeah. it makes me really really proud it really really does I just think it, although I know emotionally and physically the job does take its toll after a while yeah that you will I wouldn't swap it for anything really would not swap that for anything um, and the best bits about being an author is publication day and drinking Moe on a Monday evening and chatting with your mate on UK Crime Book Club. <laughs> uh, I think, no, I think for me it's when um, the plot just suddenly just clicks and the characters come to life to the point where you just can't get them out of your head. They're just mm. there constantly and you'll be having a conversation with somebody and you just zone out because your characters are doing exciting things and you think, I just want to go back to them which is a bit weird because it's a bit, I've got to go back and play with my invisible friends. I don't want you real life people in my way. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Christy has said, Hello, oh, Christy. Sorry. The County Line storyline was done so well. It really captured the characters and demonstrated how they get trapped in that life. How there's always a bigger fish putting terror in each person down the chain. Absolutely. And you have, you have showed that in great detail. Thank you. And it's visceral, it comes off the page, you know, you can kind of feel the fear. I'm not going to talk about any individual scenes because I think it gives something away. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you can, if you want, if you want to pick something that you think you can talk about, being as Christie's thrown you under the bus. Uh... Can we? Is there a single thing you can think of that you can discuss? So, what I, yeah, there is. Without giving too much away, I think probably the end of the book, where you sort of recap in with all the characters okay. and the two main people who were involved in the county line drink, um, Sully and I've just forgotten one of my characters' names. I've got it written down um, Ryla. Yes, I can't <laughs> believe I've just forgot. That's like forgetting one of your kids' names, isn't it? I've got uh, Sophie I and her think thingy upstairs. <laughs> I always think to myself, I don't need to write character names down because I remember. But then in that pressure of the moment, sometimes yeah. I just go, um... And as well, because as I say, I'm now plodding along with my standalone, so I've got other characters' names in my one, head. No, they're dead <laughs> to me now. Maya who? <laughs> yeah, so the end of the book is, so when Sully and Riley, who were the main characters involved in the county lines, Basically, they um, when they realise what's happened has happened, their first thing is to go to McDonald's, even though they're not hungry, but because they've spotted this kid hanging around sort of for scraps at McDonald's who mm. looks about 13 and doesn't look like he's got a home to go to. So they know straight away we're going to go yeah. now and recruit our next. And that is how these people work. They're just always looking for the next victim and looking for the next pawn. 
So, no. yeah, not very nice. Sad. No, not very no. nice at all. Um, any plans to make Gary do anything else? Any or is Gary trying to encourage you to allow him to do other things? <laughs> I've seen that's between me and you. Gary, don't you? <laughs> No, I mean, there, is, there, there will have to be at some point, there will have to be a second edition of the real CSI. I think yeah. it can, but the crime writers. Um, so I might redo photographs. So, yeah, obviously. Show the book again, because I don't know where I've put my pile of your books that was going to display. Oh, so proudly behind me. <laughs> there we go. I don't know why I have to accompany that with a cheesy <laughs> grin as well. I'm sorry, I don't know what that would be the moment. <laughs> Yeah, so um, any plans? So, yeah, probably. Yeah, let's face it. If anyone's going to suffer in the, in the name of my eye, it's going to be poor Gary. Oh, I do love him. He is the best husband ever. He does, he does poor with a lot. <laughs> He's writing deep. Pardon? Looking out, can he hear you? Uh, no, no, I was just, I saw him. I listened. Oh, no, no, he's in the next room. He is, yeah, he is buzzing around in the next room. We're talking about you on UK Crime Book Club, Gary. Oh, oh, he said, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Modesty is his forte. Shortest honestly. cameo yeah. ever. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christy says, I could always model for the female victim in the, ne victim in the next one. You could. Is this going to be the next thing? Is this the next step in my career? <laughs> I'm going to be the model. For yeah. The, um... Oh, yeah, let's go down Worsley Wood to make you look murdered. <laughs> no, actually, that, that is another reason why <coughs> Gary, Gary ended up as the man in the bag because my friend did offer she said we could go to the woods and i could wear like american <laughs> tan tights upon yeah. the scene. i could wear american tan tights which we could sort of pull down and rip to look like i've been raped and murdered and i was like god no i can't do that because i feel like it'd be tempting fate or something but then it's all right to put your hand your husband in a bin bag i don't know i think my moral i didn't realize fine as long as you're alive in the bin bag yeah and it's with I didn't realise until this chat started that my moral compass is dangerously off kilter, isn't it? No, your morals are fine because you wouldn't actually do any of the things. Your imagination, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. however. Yeah, yeah, it's completely warped yeah. and, yeah, yeah. fair, yeah, fair yeah. enough, yeah. Dare <laughs> which cool. friend wanted to be the, the corpse in Worsley No comments. <laughs> fine. It wasn't, it wasn't a writer. Me. It wasn't a writer friend, no. Right, okay. It wasn't, yeah, and it wasn't me, so... um. <laughs> I, I do not volunteer for that particular job in Worsley Woods, no. <laughs> Again, I'm never just, say I'm never, kid, Gary never say never. I'm a pile of leaves now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that looks really nice, <clears throat> doesn't it? Roll on autumn, that's <clears throat> us. We're going so for a walk, love. <laughs> Donna said, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, Kate, you're among friends here. Know, and Christy yeah. said, well, she can't admit that on her. <laughs> And now um, they're trying to throw me into it, and apparently I live near her, so I'm the one that's going to be. Um, yeah, I'm the one that's going to be next. I'm guessing Gary's quite a bit taller than me, so it'd look like a it's child at five, the side. Six. Of... So actually, not massive, but still no, quite no. a bit taller than me. Mm, well, shorter than me, which is a bit annoying, but again, he's got all the good points, so let's not dwell on. Somebody said, just don't dig up Kate Bendelow's garden. Yeah. Your mates at work are going to be all over this. Well, I did windows. panic because I remember coming in and changing my camera lens when he was lying outside of the garden wrapped in these bin bags. And then I'm sure, did my mum ring? Or something? For whatever reason, he wasn't happy because I was a while inside. And when I'd gone outside, he decided to think it was funny to pretend to be dead. So I booted him in shock <laughs> because obviously I work on the division. I, I live on the division I work. And all I can think is... Did we put air holes in because if if he's suffocated i am not ringing the, how am i going to explain this away and actually do you know you just reminded me of something at one of my since then it must be coincidence <laughs> but since then one of my recurring nightmares is actually realizing that i've got a dead body in the garden and trying to move it because i know the police are coming for a burglary and realizing <coughs> i've got to move this dead body out the garden <coughs> just you, idea yeah of course you can <laughs> feel free I think I need to go back to therapy. I need more EMDR. I'm going back to therapy. I mean, just write it all out. Write it all yeah, out. Yeah. It must be a little, we ask this occasionally, but it must be therapeutic to, or is it, is it therapeutic, cathartic to get some things out in the book or is it harder because you're using massively? Real life? I, for Don't me, ask something similar yeah, for, for me, therapy. massively. And like I say, um, this last 
book of the Maya trilogy was the hardest because of mm. everything she goes through with the PTSD and she goes through the EMDR therapy. And again, because I say, because I'd gone through that in real life, mm. it was challenging to write because I had to remember how I felt going through that process. Yeah. And it was, oh, although it was brilliant, it was a lot. If anyone, if anyone's been through any form of counselling or therapy, they know how you know how exhausting really? and draining yeah. it is. Oh my god, it's horrendous. You just yeah. feel utterly battered when you come out. So trying to be in a good space and then trying to go back to that mindset and remember it, that was a lot. But at the end, when I finished it, I got that same wash of relief, that same cathartic feeling that this is all okay now. It's okay for me. It's okay for her. And yeah, because yeah. I actually, the reason I, I, I knew Maya was just stating at the time I was going through that therapy. Mm. And I remember telling my therapist that I'm planning, I'm, I'm going to start writing this book and it's going to be a trilogy. And this is what's going to happen in a backstory. And I remember saying, excuse the language, but I remember saying, bitch is going to go through it like I did. And I remember <laughs> her saying, you will find that massively helpful. So, yeah, it's definitely cathartic. And um, lots of dark humour again in this one. There were things, every time I'm reading something of yours, I wish it a little... I was going to say, I wish I'd have written some of the lines down, but I didn't because of what the lines were. That's <laughs> right. why I didn't write them, because I was not reading them out. But every once in a while, you just get this real snapshot of your humour. Just kind of, you can, yeah, I can imagine you saying something. Yeah, Gallo, I mean, yeah, in our, sort of in our line of work, Gallo's humour is a definitely, you can't do the job without yeah. it. You just can't. And we're always quick to sort of explain to people, and I can never say this enough, it's absolutely meant in no disrespect to any victims or family yeah. members we might be working with. But you've got to accept that sometimes the things we work with are dark it is disturbing it's really unpleasant and the only way you can cope about it is to laugh and it's just it's it's like this that the old saying is it uh cry at a wedding laugh at a funeral it's very very true that's it's, yeah. it's human emotion isn't it it's how you, you need that barrier. deal with it of course you do it's how you deal yeah. with things and it's how you process things and it's how you cope with it if you were to let your emotions go on every single real life job you did you'd, you'd not last 12 months and i've seen people who've not managed to last very long and it's yeah you do have to laugh and again that comes and that's one of the things I like about the writing although sometimes I feel like I have to sort of tone it down a little bit because I think if I if I wrote it too much like it was in real life people would be horrified this is you holding back that yeah is it is it is, it is. <laughs> has Ian your editor or anybody from the publishing house have they made you dial anything back or have they said, do you know what? I think you could take that one a bit further. I think you're worrying a bit much there. Yeah, no, they've pretty much given me, on, on that sort of thing, they've pretty much given me full reign. And I, I love Ian's brilliant. One of the things I love as well about Ian is when he'll put comments in and then when I, I have written something that's a bit sort of close to the bone, I love it because he'll put a little ha or something. And that, that's <laughs> like, I like that reassurance that I'm not a complete weirdo. <laughs> this is somebody normal in society does find this quite amusing and don't recoil in horror going oh my god you're a wrong one so yeah Andy's just said let them be horrified which is a good point yeah yeah you do want to let people is, know actually. yeah yeah what about the um the funny things that you think right actually I need to lighten I need a bit of not just with dark humor but I need to lighten the scene somehow so how am I going to go for this really really dark bit because there's yeah. some quite gruesome stuff in your books is there do you not think the beginning of um definitely dead it's pretty gruesome. Have you completely forgotten what you wrote? No, 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 I've not. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just putting myself in there. Is it, is it, is it the condition of the house that disturbed you, or the? Uh, no, I can get past that because right. things happen. Yeah, that kind of. I mean, it's not great, and you'd worry about the person living in that house. Yeah. But no, I don't. I just don't want to spoil the beginning of a book. Yeah. But it's a bit grim. Yeah. I suppose so. I just think it's funny. I don't know. Maybe I just I am a wrong. Girl. It was funny as well. Yeah, it was. Um, but it you is, are a bit grim, and I love that about you. But, fine line, yeah. and I just think as well. Sometimes it's it's quite nice to write something that's really, really, really dark because again, going back to what we were saying earlier, it's cathartic because you think mm. this is a snapshot of in reality what you see and what you deal with it. So yeah, don't hold back. Just do it. Like like Andy just said. Yeah, let them be horrified. Yeah, maybe I think sometimes. Yeah. 
and, and I already know I'm, I'm sort of earlier on in the in the standalone but that's not um yeah that's that's not going to be um a light-hearted <laughs> giggle that's, yeah, that, that's gonna yeah that's gonna get quite yeah that's gonna get I don't quite think dark. we're ever gonna get a light-hearted romp through right. the park would you based on <laughs> the things that we've already talked about in this I'm not coming to worse than I might try yet. romance I might surprise you now and I might turn my hand to romance I just or think you erotica one of them really quickly yeah that'd be the erotica <laughs> when he's upside down in the wardrobe with a tangerine in his mouth and he asphyxiates <laughs> I've crossed the line again haven't I sorry no it's quite sim- I'm thinking it's quite similar <laughs> To um, Guy Hale, um, I've got guys to he, guy kindly, kindly gifted me his, uh, his latest book, and I'm, I've not read it yet. That's the next one I'm going to read. So yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. There'll not be anything that shocks you, which no. is uh, quite disturbing. Um, because yeah, he, he he has his moments. Yeah. Somebody said praying mantis. Um, Kate is definitely grim, but in the best way, says uh, Krista. Oh, you are. Well, you do. You Christy. make it palatable, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> but you do. <laughs> you make the grim palatable. I'm getting that on a tattoo somewhere. Yeah. But, Am yeah, I getting that as a headline t-shirt. somewhere? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I make the grim palatable. Thanks, mate. I love that. <laughs> you oh, do. you smooth talker. I did. <laughs> I did really think when I was reading this one, um, I thought, right. I remember reading things in the other ones. I'm not going to eat while I'm reading. Okay. It's very rare that I, I, I can sit in yeah, the second Yeah, the second Shattered, shattered really Bones that. was a bit, yeah, Shattered Bones was a bit grotty for that one too. Yeah. It, it has moments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think actually now I think about it, yeah, I think probably out of the three, this is, yeah, this is the darkest of them, of them all, I think, isn't it? In some ways, yeah. yeah. In other ways, no. I think you've mm. got a really good balance. They've all got... A similar feel, you can tell you've written them, but they're all very different books. Mm. So yeah. I was going to say something else then, and then I thought, I can't do that. I can't <laughs> ask you that one. This is the thing. I said, I, said to him, I said to Kate before we came on, I might have already said this through the interview as well, I love you, but I don't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because and, of something um, that and now you need to read book. all three. Yeah. You need to yeah. read all three and find out why. It must have been nice to bring the story full circle yes because you've had kind of an idea for the whole character arc for Maya yeah for various other people you Mm -hmm. know you've known from each book did anything change while you were writing did you decide actually that arc doesn't work no that that backstory like I say I I, I developed that while I was going through my therapy so that backstory was always going to stay and although I didn't know much about what was I knew what was going to happen at the end of Definitely Dead, I didn't know what was going to happen at the beginning or the bit in the middle, which is a bit of a, I'm told is a bit of the important bit if you're going to write something. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, yeah, I knew that. you mean as well? Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Um, mm. Yeah, I I knew the backstory was always going to be that way. Um, and I'm pleased, I think, with how it's conveyed and how it's come across. You should it's be, not because an easy, I did it's not, not an easy. Get it. Did you not? Did I you did not? not uh, there nope. was a there was a twist with the backstory, wasn't there? Yeah. So I'm very yeah. impressed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Christy said as well. Um I've only got I can only yeah, I was gonna say I can't I can't see who's who here. I've just the last one and she laughed. Yeah, she did when she she messaged yeah, she She messaged me. She messaged me about the mean thing I did and I laughed. Yeah, I did. I did. You laughed in my face. I know, sorry, mate. But then again, to be fair, in book one I knew that was gonna happen. But I can't tell you what, you have to read it. Yeah, you've got to read it. Yeah. You've got to read it. Oh my word. But you oh. see as well, all I'd, I'd already committed a cardinal sin because in book one, the cat got it. And obviously, you know, if you're a crime writer, you can you can murder anybody, but don't touch the animals. So I did, yeah, I went for the you cat. you not read so. Save the Cat? Hmm? Have you not read Save the Cat? No. There's Do a I need to? Oh, is there? Save right. The cat. <laughs> yeah. And it's you show a person, a, a person's true character by how they treat the cat. For right, example. okay. 
so people have switched it up. There's been cats and dogs, and there was an unusual one. I forget what it was off the top of my head. That'll come back to me the second we go off air. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even bad guys can, you know, save the cats and or they can be the person who harms the cat. Yeah. And it shows a lot about the character. That's the right. very short version of oh. it. It's a bit right. more complicated than that. Shall I drop my book off for you? Yes, please. Love. <laughs> I'll have a wander around, get my steps yeah. in. Cheers, mate. Get your steps in. <laughs> Come and have a glass of Moe. <laughs> oh, that's what I need more yeah. alcohol. Yeah. Come and have a glass of Moe on the rattan while it's dry. <laughs> going in your garden. Hey? I'm not coming around You're not going in my garden. garden. Not going near those rose bushes. My garden's my pride by. and joy. I'll have I know it's now. gorgeous, but I'm not going in. <laughs> Oh uh, right, we've got two minutes left. So, oh my gosh, that's flown by. Of course, it has. It's me and you, Gabby. Yeah, for an no, hour. No. <laughs> Give us a recap of the um, the brilliant, absolutely brilliant Maya Barton trilogy. Okay, so Maya Barton is a scenes of crime officer who starts as a newbie, and the very first suspicious death, sorry, the very first sudden death she goes to is quickly decided that it's not suspicious. There's no sense of foul play. And there's something as she's leaving that crime scene, her instinct kicked in and she thinks there's something wrong. And then a succession of other deaths happen and she realises that all of a sudden all these deaths that had seemed not suspicious are all known criminals. And she decides she decides, and her instinct again is telling her somebody's bumping these people off. Mm. And she then starts to think police corruption, it's got to be um, somebody in the job. That's book one. Book two, she investigates um, a death of, the, so a, there is a body found in the water and he has a bank card on him. Um, but when they go and make inquiries with that person, it's not the person who's in the water. It's not that person whose bank card it is. So that all comes to fruition. Whilst all this is going on, they're investigating that death. Obviously, the backstory is happening when her estranged father is released from prison and she's terrified because she's convinced he's going to come and stalk her and wants to harm her and her mother. But And I have to say, Marcus Naylor's a really good name as well. Do you like that? I do. Thank it, you. It felt right for him. But anyway, yeah. sorry, I'm yeah. sink, um, And yeah, so basically, um, she's worried that his Marcus is going to harm her and her mum. But while he's been in prison marcus has found god so he's a changed man or is he do, do, do. and book three is um the conclusion of that backstory with maya as she goes through a treatment called emdr to unravel her ptsd which was caused by her childhood and she puts the uh, connections of her childhood to the past whilst dealing with a succession of knife crimes and looking into um victims who have been dealt with through county lines and cuckoo in and again there is a fatal stabbing and it fa it centers around this character who is stabbed who actually did it and especially when you know that your character is a teenage boy and a seemingly innocent te teenage boy or is he du, du, du. <laughs> like doing that Go annoy the family by it. doing that the rest of the night. <laughs> I can imagine the, the more my way goes down, the more that sound's going to come out. Nate's yeah. going to be banging on the wall. Yeah. Um. Thank you to everyone who's watched tonight. Thanks, guys. Thanks for thank joining you us. To, uh, thank you for coming to us for your publication day. Oh, thank interview. you for having me. It's been lovely. Anytime. Lovely to have an actor and a catch-up. <laughs> and um, I'll see you in Harrogate. You will. So, um, are you taking any books to Harrogate for people to sign? Or can um, they bring a book? They can bring, yeah, they can bring a book. I'm not planning on taking any. I've, I've got a th I've none of the other series. I've got a few of Flesh and Blood. Mm. So, yeah. Um, Save I, me one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll bob, bob around the corner and get one. Right. After you, but, okay. um, not make you take it to Harrogate. Right. No problem. <laughs> well, thank you so much. No, and best you. of luck with it. Thank you very much. Hope I look forward to seeing you next weekend. And thanks for tuning in, guys.